Thanks again to the Second Line Brass Band. I, th I think we should have gotten a worse band because it's definitely going to be all downhill from here tonight. Um, we also definitely want to thank Cambridge Public Library for Muna, you've been amazing. Thank you for uh, giving us this amazing space this evening uh, to have this event. Um, my name is Griff Peterson, and I'm a, I'm a Cambridge resident. I'm an alum of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And on behalf of myself and the four co-organizers, Yarden, Alonzo, Ryan, and Caitlin, uh, we just want to thank you all for being here. I think we ordered exactly the right amount of pizza, so that's we're off to a good start. Um, we are recording this event, and we're going to be putting it on, on online later. So just keep that in mind during the discussion phase and everything. So as, as we're starting, I wanted to speak just for two minutes about um, how this event came to be and what our plan is tonight and the type of thing that we're hoping to catalyze through this gathering. I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, a year ago, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, visited Harvard and MIT as part of his PR tour of the US. This was months before um, Jamal Khashoggi's murder. He was still alive. Um, but the Saudi-led war on Yemen was already into its fourth year. And it was abundantly clear to most of us that uh, bin Salman was not the reformer that Tom Friedman of the New York Times told us that he was. Uh, the visit was handled with a lot of secrecy by both Harvard and MIT. Um, but despite this, members of our community, many of whom are here tonight, uh, were able to both protest the visit, or they were able to protest the visit, write a number of articles that shined light on the academic partnerships with Saudi Arabia. And we even passed a resolution with Cambridge City Council that denounced both the visit and the secrecy with which it was handled. And a lot of people that hear, the, a lot of the people who you'll hear from this evening met in the aftermath of bin Salman's visit, which is how tonight's gathering came to be. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we're not here just because we're concerned with Saudi Arabia um, or even with university partnerships in general. I think for us, the bin Salman visit last March exemplified what we see as a broad structural problem with universities, and that is that they are fundamentally undemocratic institutions. And when university administrators and a subset of willing faculty act in our name but without our input, we are left with schools that work for donors, corporations, the military, foreign investors, but not for the people. And so the lack of democracy that's apparent um, in schools and in, in this disconnect I'm talking about is very apparent um, when you sort of look at the mission of to pursue truth and change the world for the better and we compare that to the realities of the operations of, of our schools. We see this disconnect when administrators ignore petitions that are signed by the vast majority of the student body, when dining service workers have to go on strike because they're not being paid enough to, to get health care, when weapons manufacturers are you know, happily invited to student job fairs, and again, very recently, when President Bacow told Harvard fossil fuel and um, prison divestment campaigns that the $40 billion endowment at Harvard is apolitical and not a, an appropriate tool to enact social change. His words, not mine. Um, so in the first part of tonight's uh, event, we want to hear from about a dozen people who have prepared very short um, you know, interventions to talk about the harms that are caused when universities operate this way. We're going to use the Saudi partnerships with Harvard and MIT as a starting point and very quickly uh, expand outwards. The questions that these speakers are, are grappling with are, are complicated in part because they're hard to answer because universities are so secret. And the secrecy denies us as students, faculty, staff, alumni, and, and neighbors a chance to deliberate and take action. So in the second section of our event, we're going to be talking about disclosure. And we're going to be addressing the things that we don't know but that we think we have a right to know about the dealings that universities make behind closed doors. But you know, finally, reckoning and disclosure are not enough. I think if we want to change the deep structural issues, we need to think imaginatively and creatively about what a different university will look like. And so in this final section this evening, repair, we're going to hear about existing and hypothetical efforts to repair this broken system. We'll then invite each of you to come share your feedback. And then at 8 o'clock, we're going to continue the discussion with pizza outside. So that we hope, we hope that this event tonight is going to be just one in a long sequence of efforts to bring about transformative democratic change to our universities in Boston and beyond. In creating actionable knowledge together, we're hoping to not only tell more accurate st stories about how universities operate, but also try to insist on ways that they could be better. So to kick off the reckoning phase tonight, I'm going to watch a, we're going to put on a short video that features two people who couldn't be here tonight in person. Um, Harvard alum Dr. Shireen Aladimi is first going to describe the war in Yemen and how some of our universities are implicated in it through their relationships and partnerships with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to hear from Cambridge City Council member Quentin Zondervan 
who is at a very important bicycle safety event right now. Um, he's going to talk about why we as residents of this area deserve better from our schools. My name is Shereen Aladimi, and I'm an assistant professor of education at Michigan State University. I was born in Yemen, and I earned my doctorate from the Harvard Graduate School of Education in 2018. The conflict in Yemen began with um, Yemenis demanding change in the government in 2011, and unfortunately that led to a couple of years of civil unrest and what was starting to look like maybe a civil war. And in 2015, this completely escalated and cannot, can no longer be honestly called a civil war given how much foreign intervention there is. But in, in 2015, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates formed a coalition of several African and Arab countries uh, with extensive support from Western allies like the United States and the UK and began bombing Yemen, supposedly to restore President Hadi to power in Yemen. President Hadi is an ally of Saudi Arabia, and even though he was appointed in a, you know, a two-year term, and that term had already expired, and he um, resigned at some point, um, Saudi Arabia and the UN still continue to recognize him as the legitimate president of Yemen. Uh, and he is no longer based in Yemen. He, is he, he and his government are based in Saudi Arabia. And so since 2015, Yemenis have been undergoing the worst kind of um, humanitarian crisis that we're seeing. The UN calls this the worst humanitarian crisis on earth, with uh, 3 million people displaced internally. And the reason for that is that there is also a land, air, and sea blockade that prevents people from, from leaving the country, even to seek medical care. And so people end up dying from simple diseases. Um, 60,000 people, at the very least, have been killed in the violence. Um, between 85,000 and 113,000 113, children have already starved to death or died of cholera, diphtheria, and preventable diseases in just two years of the war. The war has been ongoing now for almost four years. Uh, millions of people lack access to fuel, lack access to electricity, lack access to basic health care. Hospitals, schools, homes, markets have been bombed repeatedly by the Saudi-led coalition. Uh, even food and water plants have been targeted as well. So um, the United States' role, of course, has been tremendous. Um, the U.S. Um, has been helping the Saudi Arabians on, very, on many fronts. There are U.S. special forces on the ground at the Yemen-Saudi Arabia border. The, there are also U.S. US generals in the command room helping with targeting. Uh, they have been helping with mid-air refueling up until November 2018. Uh, they continue to train Saudi soldiers and uh, pilots. They continue to update and maintain their aircrafts and vehicles. And in addition to all of this, both Obama and Trump have sold hundreds of billions of dollars worth of weapons to the United uh, Arab Emirates and to the Saudi-led coalition. Uh, and, and just a couple of months ago, the House uh, Congress declared that the U.S. has been at war in Yemen in violation of U.S. federal law, and hopefully we will see a similar bill passed in the Senate at the end of this month, SJRS 7, which also calls for President Trump to end all hostilities in Yemen because declaring war on another country is not within the power of the president, it's within the power of Congress. So um, that's our best hope to reduce the impact of the conflict and maybe even end the war. When institutions of higher education affiliate themselves with war criminals, it signals a direct contradiction between these institutions' stated goals and mission statements uh, and their actions. For example, MIT's mission statement partly states, quote, we seek to develop in each member of the MIT community the ability and passion to work wisely, creatively, and effectively for the betterment of humankind, end quote. Legitimizing war criminals, whether here at home or abroad, undermines these stated goals and communicates to those affected by war criminals, these war criminals, that their lives really don't matter and that profit is at the heart of these relationships, not these outwardly stated goals such as the betterment of humankind. At the very least, universities like MIT and Harvard should be transparent about these relationships such that each faculty member, students, and alumni are aware and well informed about the partnerships and hopefully of, are able to understand and, and see how harmful these partnerships can be. To note an example, last year um, in March of 2018, MIT, Harvard, uh, along with politicians, celebrities, and entrepreneurs across the country hosted the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, 
who is the architect of the Yemen war that has so far killed at least 60,000 people and has starved at least 85,000 children to death. And at the time, uh, at his MIT stop, a group of us protested and we hand delivered 6,000 signatures that were collected online uh, to MIT President Rafe's office. We never received a response. It wasn't until the same crown prince ordered the brutal killing of the journalist Khashoggi that MIT felt the need to respond and to publicly justify and defend these partnerships. So uh, the questions that remain are who should be accountable for these partnerships? President Rafe claims that it's up to the individual faculty members to decide. So if an individual faculty member decides to promote a racist research ag agenda, would the university step in? Is that okay? If a faculty member wants to produce chemical weapons for foreign governments, is that okay? Is that up to the discretion of a faculty member? What will it take for these institutions to stop legitimizing war criminals? If bombing school kids and murdering journalists doesn't cross the line, then what does? Hi all, my name is Quinton Zondervan and I'm a Cambridge City Councilor and MIT alumnus. I'm sorry I can't be with you all in person today, but I'm glad that I can share my thoughts via this video. I hope you're having a great event. Last year I was deeply concerned when I learned about Mohammed bin Salman's planned visit to MIT and Harvard. I submitted a council resolution which condemned the visit and criticized both universities for hosting him. This resolution was supported unanimously by my colleagues on the council. I participated in the community protest of his visit at MIT, where student activists joined Mass Peace Action on the steps of 77 Mass Ave, and we shared our objections to his presence. As a boy, I lived in a country under military dictatorship where freedoms were severely limited, so I especially cherished the opportunity to speak out when dictators and murderers are given respect they do not deserve. MIT did not provide the community with any opportunities to discuss or dissent MBS's visit. It was all done very secretly and behind the scenes. Since then, I've continued to have conversations with MIT, but they have shown no interest in changing their approach. That disappoints me greatly, and I will continue to push on this issue of how to handle visits by unwelcome dictators and other controversial figures. So why is it a problem for MIT to host MBS? Well, MBS is looking for legitimacy, and MIT is allowing him to simply buy it for cold, hard cash. Let me be clear that I do not begrudge MIT the money they receive from Saudi Arabia, but they don't have to allow the donor to gain legitimacy and goodwill from it. After MBS's visit, MIT commissioned a report from their provost, Richard Lester. The report essentially said, yeah, just because we take his money and honor him on campus doesn't mean we support his bad behavior, so we don't need to change anything. This is how institutions are able to act in a way that is both amoral and in direct contradiction to their stated values. They simply honored their biggest donors, no matter what the donor stands for or is doing in the world. In this case, oppressing women, murdering journalists, fighting devastating unnecessary wars, and selling climate change causing fossil fuels. There's a growing realization that there's something wrong with this picture. MIT is part of the community, and what happens at MIT also reflects on Cambridge. In Cambridge, we cherish transparency and partnership. MIT is a strong community partner, and they do many great things that benefit our residents and stakeholders. So it's especially hurtful when they do something extraordinary like hosting such a controversial figure as MBS without any opportunity for the Cambridge community to weigh in or even properly comment on that decision. My guess is that most residents of Cambridge and students at MIT would object to hosting MBS in our great city if they were asked. To be clear, we are not asking for a community voice in every single decision made by the university. But when the university's actions impact our lives so significantly or reflect on our community in a major way, it does seem right and fair that the community should be part of that decision. Through our local government, stakeholders have an opportunity to weigh in on major decisions that are made regarding the city. Why should universities and other institutions or corporations be exempt from transparency and accountability to their host communities? So what can we do? Through our democratic institutions like the state legislature and the city council, we have the power to ask questions. Questions like, how was it decided that MBS should be permitted to visit MIT and should be received as a dignitary? It's high time we started to demand some answers and that we start to reimagine the role we want institutions like Harvard and MIT to play in our lives and in our communities. What you are doing today is very important 
because change will happen only when community stakeholders like yourself make it clear that you want greater accountability and transparency from all the institutions and corporations that impact our lives. Thank you for being part of this conversation, and I look forward to continuing to participate in this important dialogue. Um, hi, my name's Agnes. I'm a graduate student at the Media Lab. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for organizing. Um, this is a really wonderful event. Um, um, the Media Lab is an institution that projects a rebellious public image, attracting community-minded and politically motivated students, staff, and faculty. High-profile events, such as the Disobedience Award and its accompanying slogan, no permission, no apology, paint a picture that this is an institution that stands up for what is right, not what is easy. As a student of the lab, I was sorely disappointed when it played host to Mohammed bin Salman on his visit in 2018. While he was shaking hands with Rafael Reif on the Media Lab steps, Salman was presiding over a bombing campaign of Yemen that has been described as both a war crime and a humanitarian disaster. This is not a standalone hypocrisy. The lab has recently welcomed ExxonMobil, which, along with long-running sponsor BP, continues to lobby against action on climate change. And it only recently ended its relationship with weapons manufacturer Northrop Grumman. To argue that the lab will act as a redemptive force for these entities is misguided. If anything, the lab is used as a whitewashing tool that allows these behaviors to continue unchallenged. If we claim to be conducting research that changes the world, we must also be able to ask, for whom? Lately, student-level organizing has brought demands for transparency and democracy in the lab to the fore, both in the lab's funding sources and its accountability to students and researchers. Too often, the lab has been a place where democracy exists as a marketing slogan first and a practice second. There is a will within the institution for change coming from the bottom up. The Media Lab must practice what it preaches. Hi, uh, my name is Chance. I'm a student at Boston University. Uh, BU isn't as big as MIT or Harvard. Its endowment only recently surpassed $2 billion, while MIT has an endowment of $16 billion. But this doesn't mean that the partnerships that BU has are less important, simply that they're further obscured. There are no photos of BU President Robert Brown shaking hands with Mohammed bin Salman, but he is a trustee of a Saudi petroleum research NGO aiding Aramco's exploitation of labor and resources. The billions of dollars the university accepts, uh, the billions of dollars the university accepts from corporations and individual capitalists make clear BU is just as focused on power and profit as MIT and Harvard. This was seen when BU trustee and UAE-based billionaire Rajan Kilachand donated over $100 million to construct a new building on campus in his name. It was seen when the university invited the Emirati Consulate General onto campus for an event nominally about diversity effectively whitewashing the UAE's image as a racist monarchy reliant on a migrant labor force working in conditions of near slavery and leading a, a leading member of the coalition committing genocide in Yemen. It is seen when the huge monopoly Johnson & Johnson, whose products have regularly been found to be carcinogenic, dangerous, and aiding the opioid epidemic, gives tens of millions of dollars to BU fundraising campaigns. It is seen as BU invites weapons manufacturers to engineering career fairs. But the true extent of BU's relationships with despotic regimes, profit-hungry corporations, and the US military machine is unknown. These relationships enjoy the safety of the dark, found in investment portfolios instead of in photo ops.
Hi, I'm Paul Shannon. I'm with the Raytheon anti-war campaign. Yemen used to seem so far away, but we're finding out it's very, very close. Massachusetts-based Raytheon is a key player in the war crimes being committed in this epic human disaster. Nine plants in Massachusetts, the core of the Massachusetts economy. As you know, it's selling billions of dollars worth of weapons to the Saudis and to the United Arab Emirates, including the guided bombs used to kill civilians and destroy the civilian infrastructure of Yemen. <coughs> Raytheon is proud of it. It says it will continue to sell weapons to the Saudi government. Its chief executive officer recently said, I'm pretty confident we'll weather this complexity. But weapon sales are not even the main connection between Raytheon and the Saudis. 50 years relationship. 400 employees working in Saudi Arabia. Just about ready to open up a Raytheon subsidiary <clears throat> in Riyadh itself. Spreads the wealth around, though. Raytheon Emirates. This is nine days ago. Raytheon Emirates opens new headquarters in Abu Dhabi. The beat goes on. The Gulf monarchies, if you read Raytheon publications, which I'm sure all of you do, <laughs> are seen by Raytheon to be a key part of the company's future. Of course, Raytheon is not only intertwined with the uh, Saudis and UAE. Nowadays, wealth, Raytheon is welcomed with open arms. You'd think there was nothing wrong at all going on at university career fairs and recruit students at our leading universities, as you've heard. MIT, Tufts, Boston University, Northeastern, UMass, Amherst, UMass Lowell, who knows what others. Recent, recently, Raytheon launched a new cybersecurity initiative with MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. According to Raytheon's vice president, this will give Raytheon access to other initiatives at MIT. Of course, you have the Raytheon Amphitheater at Northeastern. Raytheon is an industry partner for MIT's Office of Minority Education and hosts multiple Raytheon information sessions for minority students. Just one big happy family, and we're sitting in the middle of it. The point is, it's time for our colleges and universities to cut ties to Raytheon and the gangsters with whom it is completely entangled. Thank you. Hi, I'm Caitlin, and I'm a PhD student in Islamic history at Harvard. I'd like to raise a concern about the image on the front of our program today, the one of MIT President Raphael Raif shaking hands with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Specifically, I worry that the shock value of the image comes not just from seeing Raif warmly greet a war criminal, but also from Mohammed bin Salman's traditional garb, his beard, his obvious Arabness, from the sense that a lofty institution of research and learning is being sullied through contact with the Saudi despot. By this latter reading, 
All MIT would have to do to become pure again is to cut ties with a specific nefarious entity. This kind of thinking may be tempting because it offers a relatively tidy solution and doesn't demand of us any further grappling with how universities operate in the world. However, universities, especially elite universities, are not neutral bystanders to the world order. They help to shape it. At Harvard, we need not look further than recent history to see examples of people, ideas, and actions grounded in the university that have undergirded a more violent world bent to US imperial interests. The Clash of Civilizations thesis, developed by former Harvard professor and director of the Center for International Affairs, Samuel Huntington, has been invoked frequently to justify the war on terror. The co-founder of that same center, Dr. Henry Kissinger, went from his academic training and career at Harvard to direct massive bombing campaigns in South Asia and to promote and prop up repressive governments there and elsewhere. And just this past fall, the Kennedy School of Government hosted members of the Venezuelan opposition to plan the overthrow of Nicolas Maduro here on campus. We might like to dismiss these examples as bad apples or to debate the very nature of their impact. My point is, let's at least not be naive about the impact. Let's have these conversations. Let's not shy away from them by thinking, as in my own case, I'm in the humanities. What does this have to do with me? The humanities, too, play a role here, whether as whitewashing for the university or as billboards available for purchase by millionaires and billionaires like the Saudi prince al Walid bin Talal. Moreover, regardless of what corner of academia we occupy, these universities are our professional communities, our institutional homes, and we have a responsibility to them. Part of that responsibility is working to see them and ourselves in all our complexity and with as, as much honesty as possible, to consider the range of harms that take place in our name prior to and paving the way for partnerships like the ones with Mohammed bin Salman. Partnerships are just one way that universities shape and are shaped by the world order, and grappling with them means grappling with this broader context as well. Hi, um, my name is Alice. I work down at MIT. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about an event hopefully you all heard at least something about that was just a few weeks back uh, and about MIT's relationship with the Hindu fascist movement in India. So just a few weeks ago, the 2009 uh, MIT India conference was held actually in the Media Lab, um, and uh, at which a right-wing homophobic and Islamophobic Indian politician whose name is uh, Subramanian Swamy uh, was invited to speak. Around 2,000 people actually signed a petition opposing his invitation to campus and calling on MIT uh, and the organizers of the conference to disinvite him. Um, based mainly on his, his previous public comments that homosexuality is a disease for which a cure should be sought and that anyone who kills a cow should be hanged, among many other similar and equally outrageous things. Um, despite this outpouring of opposition from kind of all corners of the campus, the MIT administration refused to disinvite Swami, hiding behind a flimsy excuse of wanting to respect his freedom of expression. Now, this sort of response is really not so unusual from elite universities, but I think this decision in particular crystallizes the role that universities like MIT uh, play in US imperialism more broadly. Now, why is that? Swami is a member of the current ruling party in India. It's called the BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party. Um, this party is a pro-imperialist party, which openly, well not so openly, but very clearly and constantly promotes the neo-colonial exploitation of the country. At the same time, they whip up anti-Muslim sentiment among the Hindu majority and to try to get basically poor people to think that their poverty is the fault of Muslims or foreign invaders um, rather than the imperialist regime of extraction <laughs> that they live under. This often leads to pogroms and lynchings and terrible forms of violence. So the people of India are really subjected to two forms of oppression, the outright violence of the Hindu fascist terror and the extractive economic plunder of US imperialism. 
MIT is actually involved in both of them. <laughs> Training Indians to be pro-US business functionaries down at the Sloan School, where the majority of the organizers of this conference were students, um, and also inviting right-wing ideologues like Swami to campus and refusing to disinvite them. So in my view, when we see these kind of things and we see what's going on, we here in the US who live in this empire have a real uh, need and a real duty to stand up and oppose this stuff. This, this system of imperialism is a bloody and despicable system and the money that's, that's uh, extracted from the people of the world by it is actually just drenched in blood. But that's the, the movement against it can't just live on university campuses actually. We can't think that we can just take MIT and make it a little clean island that's separate from this system. We need to build a broader anti-imperialist movement to be able to really challenge this stuff and, and ultimately destroy the system. But thank you. So hi, my name is Nathan Foster, and I'm an alumni of Tufts University and a member of the Sack Sackler Coalition. In June of 2013, Tufts President Anthony Monaco traveled to the headquarters of Purdue Pharmaceuticals, the now disgraced makers of OxyContin, to give Raymond Sackler an honorary degree. He had good reason to. Raymond and two of his brothers gave the money to found the Sackler School of Biomedical Sciences in 1980, and Tufts' master's program in pain management was funded by Purdue. The Sacklers, meanwhile, had good reason to donate. As the owners of Purdue, they made billions from OxyContin while systematically lying about its addictive effects. They used their donations to Tufts to gain access to doctors, place unlabeled pro-opioid materials in the pain management curriculum, and get favorable testimony before the FDA from actually the head of the pain management curriculum. According to a lawsuit from the Massachusetts Attorney General, Purdue considered their donations to Tufts a model for influencing medical schools and universities across the country. As a Tufts alumni, I am ashamed of our role in the opioid crisis. That's why I'm part of the Sack Sackler Coalition, working to hold Tufts and the Sackler family accountable. And the thing about shame is that it's a really, really powerful feeling. It can make people get defensive sometimes and create excuses because the alternative is difficult to bear. Um, we're facing a little bit of that. But on the other hand, shame is necessary. Shame affirms our responsibility to others. When your university president shows up in the same image as the assassin of Jamal Khashoggi, or when they honor one of the men most responsible for the opioid crisis, feel shame, then do something about it. Shame is the first step towards taking ownership of our universities. Catholic, so I love shame as a tactic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Annika Dunbar Gronke. I'm a 3L at Harvard Law School, and I'm an organizing member of the Harvard Prison Divestment Coalition, or sorry, campaign. Uh, and we are demanding that Harvard disclose its $37 billion endowment to companies. Uh, or its investments in companies that profit off of human caging. We are also demanding that they divest those holdings from the prison industrial complex and reinvest into initiatives, businesses, projects, and programs that are led by communities most impacted by the legacies of enslavement um, of, uh, of Africans and the subsequent system of human caging, also known as mass incarceration. We demand that Harvard not only divest and disclose, but that they also repair and rebuild. We know Harvard's history. The school, as well as many other institutes of higher education, not to mention this entire country, uh, were built off of the backs of unpaid enslaved Africans and amid mass killings of indigenous people and the creation of white supremacy. We also know that the school continues to build its incredible wealth by investing in the ongoing subjugation of black, brown, indigenous, poor, queer, trans, and disabled people. And the technology it invests in, to the point that many folks have been making about um, international effects of these investments, these technologies are used everywhere from Roxbury to Ramallah to Tijuana and all across the southern border of this United States as well as abroad. 
In 2019, we are saying enough. We are saying not with our tuition dollars, and we are saying not in our name. We are petitioning for the disclosure of the endowments first, um, and we have a petition with over 3,000 signatures, and it is growing. Um, there are flyers back there if anyone like, would like to sign on. And we will, we will be delivering this petition to Larry Bacow on March 1st at 11.30 a.m. in Harvard Yard. Our endowment is political, as it is. This university's choice to prioritize profits over human beings is absolutely political. President Bacow's equating of divesting from prisons to divesting from in corn syrup is absolutely political. Endorsing the criminalization of black, brown, and poor bodies is political. And if you agree uh, that this university must take responsibility for its very political endowment and divest in order to change its atrocious political history, please sign our petition and please join us at our, at our gathering on Friday. Hi, I'm Lee Ferris with the Cambridge Residence Alliance, a grassroots group here in Cambridge. So we've heard about what the universities are doing overseas. What are they doing right here in Cambridge? So the universities in Cambridge and Boston operate as for-profit real estate developers that are looking to maximize profits. They ignore what the community needs and wants. Their profits lead to gentrification and displacement of long-term residents, especially people of color. I'll speak more about MIT, but Harvard is making the same kind of deals in Alston. MIT's real estate company builds commercial development on its land instead of constructing academic buildings or urgently needed housing for grad students and postdocs who can't afford to live here. My organization, the Cambridge Residence Alliance, calls on the city of Cambridge to require that MIT, an institution, as we've heard with a $16 billion endowment, provide dedicated housing on land that it already owns for the majority of its 5,000 grad students and postdocs who do not currently live on campus. Their search for affordable housing puts tremendous pressure on the housing market in Cambridge and it drives up rents and reduces available apartments. MIT also influences laws in Cambridge. It influences any rezoning discussed by the Cambridge City Council to benefit itself, not the community. In 2017, MIT bought the 14-acre Volpe site in Kendall Square for $750 million and got Cambridge to sharply upzone that land to include a 500 foot tall luxury tower and primarily commercial buildings for high tech and big pharma, which results in much higher profits to MIT. Only after MIT grad students banded together with residents to launch their own zoning petition did the Cambridge City Council require MIT to also build 500 new beds of graduate student housing. I encourage you to work with the Cambridge Residence Alliance to pressure MIT and Harvard to do what's right for Cambridge instead of just maximizing their profits. And some of our literature with our contact info is on the table there. Thank you. Um, my name is William, and I'm a resident of Boston, as well as a recent graduate of the Boston University School of Social Work. Um, and I'm also a member of a coalition of local groups who are working to build the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement in the greater Boston area. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS, is an international movement launched in 2005 by Palestinian civil society, calling upon members of the international community to use peaceful economic pressure in order to compel the Israeli government to abide by international law and provide the Palestinian people equal rights, equal freedom of movement, equal access to resources, and the ability to return to the land from which they have been forcibly displaced, as is guaranteed to them under international law. Locally, supporting BDS means calling upon our municipalities and our institutions, including our universities, to end contracts, to end partnerships, to end investments, 
with companies who provide the products and services that allow the Israeli government to continue to commit acts of violence and discrimination against the Palestinian people. So long as Elbit Systems makes the technology that the Israeli government uses to track, surveil, and detain Palestinians, as well as immigrants on our southern border, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, has a moral obligation to end its partnership with Elbit. So long as Northrop Grumman provides weapons and military vehicles that the Israeli army uses to enforce its displacement of Palestinians and the West Bank and East Jerusalem through the expansion of illegal settlements open only to Jewish people, Tufts University has a moral obligation to fully divest from Northrop Grumman. As a note, the Tufts student government, by a margin of 16 to 7 in 2017, called upon the Board of Trustees to do exactly that, and the Board of Trustees ignored them and has continued to do so. So long as Ahud Barak remains unapologetic and unaccountable for the poverty, trauma, and violence that he has wrought upon the 1.8 million residents of, of the Gaza Strip while he was the Israeli Defense Minister, he must never again be invited to speak at the Harvard Kennedy School as he was in 2016. Fighting for justice globally is our responsibility locally. It's also our right. We have the right to demand that the universities, that these universities use the money they accumulate in our cities from our tuition dollars, from our taxes, from our labor in ways that advance the well-being of people everywhere, not in ways that violate human rights. Hello, uh, my name is Kathleen Brown Perez. I am an enrolled member of the Brothertown Indian Nation and a uh, professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst Honors College. Um, I want to explain a little bit about who I am, but first I want to acknowledge the indigenous land on which we are sitting right now. Uh, the Wampanoag, we have the Abenaki to the north, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Nipmuc and the Mohican to the west. Uh, we are on indigenous land, and it's never stopped being indigenous land. Um, so I told you I was a, a member of the Brothertown Indian Nation. It was a nation formed in the 18th century by my 10th great-grandfather, a man by the name of Samson Oakham, uh, who was a Mohegan. He was a Presbyterian minister. He was, he was many, many things. Um, one of the things that he did, and I, I don't usually tell this story, but it's so relevant considering who I've followed here. Um, he uh, spent a few years um, in the mid-1760s traveling Europe. His mentor, Eliezer Wheelock, had the idea that uh, it would be good to raise funds to form an Indian school. So Samson Oakham went over there, and things didn't really go so great. He got to meet King George and go to Queen Charlotte's birthday party. But uh, his mentor, who told him, you know, I'll take care of your family while you're gone, really didn't do such a great job. But um, Samson Oakham raised uh, in Scotland and England, he raised a record sum for a colonial charity that's about the equal of $12 million um, right now. And um, so he came back thinking this money is going to go to a really great Indian school. Um, we now have a school called Dartmouth College. And um, uh, <laughs> uh, they, they had a little bit of a falling out because of that. And Samson Oakham wrote in his journal, uh, which Dartmouth keeps, of course, um, that he would say things like, you know, they tell us to assimilate, but no matter what I do, I'm always going to be a damn Indian to them. Um, speaking of Indians, so I'll try to speak loud enough you can hear me. Um, let's talk about the Indian with the sword over his head. They did take away the banner that says, come over and help us, finally. But we're trying to get rid of the Indian, too. UMass Amherst finally banned the Indian on our business cards this year. But sometimes it takes a little while. So I'm going to try to talk quickly, because I know we're supposed to speak quickly for just a few minutes. But um, oh, and kudos to Cambridge for recognizing that Columbus is a genocidal maniac and making indigenous people stay in its place. So. <laughs> Okay, so um, let me tell you just a little, a little bit quickly. So we live in a settler colonial society. That means that when the colonists came over, they came over to replace the indigenous people, not to learn the language, respect the religion or the culture, to eat the food. They came over to destroy, to replace. Um, settler colonialism is a structure, not an event, and we are still living in that structure. 
So um, let me tell you a little story, uh, something that happened back in December, uh, December 26, 1862 in Mankato, Minnesota. 38 Santee Sioux men were hanged. It was the largest mass execution in US history. The federal government's failure to uphold their end of treaties in which the Sioux had lost hundreds of thousands of acres um, had upset the Sioux. And um, so they began killing settlers and, and military and uh, were hanged as a result of it. The Sioux were relegated to a piece of land 20 miles by 150 miles. Not a big piece of land, but when you are here to destroy, to replace, the people are supposed to die off. So the one thing I can say for sure is we're only 1.5% of the US population, but I'm happy to say that so far, a destroy, to replace, and settler colonialism has failed because we're still here. Um, the, um, uh, so the Sioux uprising had happened between August and December of 1862. In the end, hundreds of Sioux families were interned in Minnesota jails. 303 Sioux men were sentenced to death. Lincoln commuted the sentence of 265 of them. 70 years later and 70 miles away from the execution site, my mother was born at Lower Sioux. Uh, the hate and mistrust between whites and Indians had not dissipated and she grew up hearing how much the neighbors hated her and her family. Um, so what else was happening in 1862? The first Morial Act, uh, the land that created land-grant institutions was passed in 1862. Uh, this is not a coincidence. You take a bunch of land from the biggest tribes in the middle of the country and you're gonna have a lot of land that you can give to states so they can sell it to create um, learning institutions. We have two in uh, Massachusetts, MIT and UMass Amherst. Um, um, they are, there are still a, a number of institutions like this across the country. There are 1.4 million students at 57 1862 colleges. There are 100,000 students um, at the 17, 1890 historically black land grant colleges. These were colleges created uh, with the understanding they would not discriminate on the basis of race and they are, they are black colleges. Um, they receive $700 million annually. The 29 um, tribal colleges are also now considered land-grant institutions. So what does that mean and where does this come from? Um, I'm gonna give you a nutshell um, of history that brought us to this place and created a number of the problems that we've heard about already because it's a mentality in this country. These are not things happening in a vacuum. This is what the US was founded on. Uh, stolen lands with stolen people, and how can we really expect anything else um, really to happen at this point? Um, I think I've always had a pretty low expectation of the US government, and they've continued to live up to that expectation. <laughs> um, so settler colonial society, you take away the land, the culture, and people's identity. Um, in 1823, there was a Supreme Court case called Johnson versus McIntosh. Uh, long story short, it meant that private citizens could not purchase lands from Native Americans. What that really meant was, of course, that the federal government owned all the land. If you wanted to buy a piece of land, you had to buy it from the federal government. Um, a few years later, Andrew Jackson supported the um, Indian Removal Act. His uh, painting hangs proudly now in the Oval Office, and I can't even tell you the words that went through my head when I first saw that picture, um, you know, in our current administration. Shouldn't have been shocked, but, you know. Um, so the Indian Removal Act was intended to remove Indians from the southeast into the middle of the country, and it did just that. We've all heard of the Trail of Tears. Again, this is about taking land and claiming it for the United States. All of this has the same goal. In 1831, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia came to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court determined that American Indian nations um, are, are dependent like that of a, they have a relationship like that of a ward to a guardian. Um, 1832, Worcester versus Georgia, the federal government uh, was the sole authority to deal with Indian nations. They had plenary power over Indians. Following that, in 1850, reservations came about. Indian reservations, I'm sure you've all seen them, heard of them. We have Mohegan Sun and, and um, Pequot close to us, uh, Mashpee Wampadog. Um, reservation land is owned by the federal government and it's held for the beneficial use of Indians. Originally, Indians were not allowed to leave the reservations, and in the 1930s, Hitler would use this model to create concentration camps. Um, so we had a number of things happen through the years, all of which was done to control Indians. 
um, and to decrease the amount of land we have. Because if you take people off of their land, whether it's, you know, we're talking about Palestinians or American Indians, it's going to have the same harmful effect on their health and on their um, longevity. Um, finally, in 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act was passed, so US, the American Indians got to be U.S. citizens. Um, but a number of things were happening that we call um, federal Indian policy. Um, in my spare time when I'm not teaching, I'm also a federal Indian law attorney, so I get to deal with these, the ongoing effects of these policies still. Um, there were a number of them that claimed to have um, the goal of benefiting Indians, and in reality, we're actually there about controlling and, and destroying us. In 1965, an era called self-determination was entered into, where Indian tribes were supposed to be able to control themselves and their people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what actually happened during the 60s and 70s, again, still you know, hundreds of years into um, you know, the United States of America, and we're still trying to you know, destroy to replace. This idea has never, ever, ever left the minds of the policymakers and the lawmakers. So in the 60s and 70s, during an era of self-determination, 25% of the American Indian women between the ages of 15 and 45 were sterilized. Um, without informed consent, as you can imagine. Some children went in to have their wisdom teeth pulled out and came out sterile, or were told they could have a womb trans transplant if they ever wanted to have children. Um, I was born in 1965, the last of three children, because when um, my mother uh, was having me C-section, her doctor decided three kids was enough, and he did a tubal ligation, and that's what she woke up to. Um, in 1970, the average American Indian woman had 3.29 children. In 1980, it's one point, it was 1.3 children. So while abortion rights have declined for others in order to make sure that the number of non-Indians continues to increase, um, the number of uh, American Indians has continued to decrease. So that is the settler colonial society, not in just in which we live, but which also created and supported many of the universities that we're having issues with now. So are we, am I surprised? Should any, any of us be surprised? No. Should we think of it as inevitable and something that we can't control and we can't get rid of? Oh, hell no. Um, you know, I love to, to end some talks by giving people, and I know I've talked way too long, and I'm sorry about that. I even have my timer on just to tell me how much I'm going over. But um, <laughs> um, uh, I just like to, to remind people that you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution, but there is no such thing as neutral. Switzerland is a country, not a person. And um, so you need to recognize where you are. You know, get out of your bubble, get out of your comfort zone, because no solution ever existed inside of a comfort zone. So what started and continues with American Indians, you know, it, I mean, it's still a thing today, and that's why we have to come together. As long as they continue to tell us that our problems are separate and distinct and we don't have anything in common, as long as we believe that, we will never defeat them, ever. So we have to come together and fight back. So thank you. Okay, we're in the disclose section now. Um, thanks to all the people who've spoken, thanks to the organizers, thanks to all of you who've come. My name is Sally Haslinger, and I'm professor of philosophy and women's and gender studies at MIT. Um, there's a lot to say about issues of disclosure. I'm going to say a little bit about why disclosure is important, what should be disclosed, what was disclosed by MIT, and why it is, in effect, I mean, insufficient. Um, so, First, I want to just point out, I'm going to be talking about um, specifically the disclosure of partnerships, not the disclosure of information from endowment investments. That's important, too. It's really important. People have talked about that. But this is a focus right now on the recent controversies at MIT about the relationship with Saudi uh, Arabia. OK, so why is disclosure important? Well, here's the word of the day, plutocracy. A plutocracy is government by the wealthy. And it's not necessarily uh, a government in the sense of you know, a country's government, a nation state's government, but government in many different contexts by the wealthy. And since universities have been, um, uh, the funding for universities from the government, from um, uh, taxpayers and such, has been increasingly decreasing, um, 
Uh, now we have university plutocracies. So universities are run by wealthy. Now this is, you might think, a violation of the integrity of uh, scientific research because who gets the money isn't who's got the best research or who is going to contribute most to the good of humanity. Who gets the money is who's going to produce a widget for some engineering you know, tycoon. Or who gets the money is who's going to produce weapons uh, for Saudi Arabia. Or who's going to do the things that, uh, that where there's money behind it. And this is violating the integrity of the university at a very deep level, I believe. I am a philosopher. Do you think there's like $5 million for philosophers? Do you think that philosophers could do some good in the world? Yes, I do. Social scientists, humanists, other people who could do good in the world. But we aren't funded because people who make billions of dollars don't want our voices, right? And don't want the voices of other marginalized groups. I'm not saying philosophers are marginalized. Oh my god, they're mostly white men, right? <laughs> Straight, cis, white men. OK, OK, forget. I'm, I, ca I have this problem. I tend to rant, so forgive me. OK, so the disclosure is important because it's a violation of, the, of scientific integrity. But also, it's clearly important because the money that gets invested in universities is used for bad purposes, right? Evil purposes, problematic purposes, and we've heard about that. OK, so this is something. Uh, so one thing I have to say is that MIT has been responsive to demands that they disclose, that they reconsider um, their uh, partnerships with uh, Saudi Arabia. I think that that's a good thing. I think that the responses have been terribly, terribly inadequate badly argued. I mean, you, oh my god. I mean, oh well. OK. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things that uh, isn't completely unclear to most of us is how much control the, the uh, funding sources have over what is done in the research. And so I'll say a little bit from the report. This is a quote from uh, Lester's first report. Um, as most readers of this report will know, Sponsored research is carried out under agreements between MIT and the sponsor that specify the area of work, the broad objectives of the research, and other terms under which the work is done, including the amount and timing of funding to cover research costs and the disposition of any intellectual property that may result. That is dealt with. That is part of the contract that MIT has with, say, Saudi Arabia or Raytheon or things like this. It includes the content, right, and then they say, Oh, right, but we do not grant sponsors any right to exert influence over the manner of performance of the work or its results. They guarantee the right of researchers to publish their findings. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> sponsored research enables MIT, the sponsor, the scientific community, and the general public to benefit from new scientific discoveries and the development of new technologies and it gives opportunities to MIT students. OK, so great. What you have is they control, the funders control the content. They control things like the terms under the which the work is done, the amount and the timing of the funding, and the disposition of intellectual property, though of course the research should get to publish it, because what's important is our glory. right? OK. So these are issues that are extremely important. And you do get in some of this report information like uh, Saudi Aramco has supported faculty-led projects in fields including computer simulation of oil and gas reservoirs, catalysis, carbon capture technology, et cetera, et cetera. I know I'm not, I don't understand this. I'm, I'm a philosopher, right? But I've talked to people, Jonathan, for example. It's all so vague. How on earth would we really know what they're doing, why they're doing it, what they're using it for? But they're controlling it, right? And it's not disclosed what most of this um, is about. OK, so they did disclose. Here's MIT's report on Saudi collaborations. So um, it looks like what, <laughs> at least what, um, what uh, Lester said um, is that the Saudi investment is a 0.2% of uh, MIT's revenue. So it's a very tiny amount. I'll come back to that. But it is 52% is, and here's the, uh, the little circles, 52, the share of total expenditures from fiscal year 16 to 17, 52% is in the sponsored research programs where there is Aramco, SABIC, CAST, um, et cetera. Uh, 44 percent is in the gift-enabled activities with Jamil Poverty Action Lab, the water and food systems, et cetera. 
and 4% are other programs that are uh, professional educational programs and such like that. So um, the terms of the partnership are not disclosed and uh, the absolute dollar amounts is very vague that they, that they give us. But it does seem like a relatively small amount. But one of the things that's hysterical about this, in, in addition to all the things I've already mentioned, and I haven't even gotten into the report and the, the details of it, is they go on and say, oh yeah, it's such a small amount. And you know, really, it's really only affecting a very small number of people. There are 27 women in the whole years of 15 years that they've been getting money. Uh, I think it's from CAST. 27 women we've helped. And um, there are 28 researchers who are involved and 15 other people um, who've really been benefited by this, right? And so if you add all of those up, that's including the PIs who would be funded by MIT if they lost their Saudi funding, right? They've, MIT's already said that. We have 42 people, at least listed here, 42 people who've been, you know, uh, whose lives have been bettered by having an affiliation with MIT. You know, that seems pretty pathetic. But when MIT's been asked about, you know, well, you know, look at the millions of people, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who have been um, starved or bombed or et cetera like that, they said, oh, that's really too, too high a benchmark for really considering, given how small it is, we should just be happy we're helping these 42 people. Anyway, um, I uh, my time is up. I didn't even start my timer, but I know it's up. Um, so what I think is that um, there is a kind of um, self-deception is a nice way to put it, but there's a kind of management of information here that is being done in order to mask what's really going on. And in order, do you realize, tomorrow, by the way, Kissinger, Henry Kissinger has been invited to speak at the opening of the Schwarzman Center for Computing tomorrow. 2.30, Kresge Lawn, we're gonna have a demonstration. Schwarzman, a really bad guy. Really, really bad guy, right? These are people who are funding and uh, supporting and opening and celebrating the Schwarzman Center. Um, so Saudi Arabia is just one of the many things that we've heard that MIT uh, needs to get out of. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yarden. I'm one of the co-organizers. I'm a fellow at Harvard Medical School and an MIT alum. Um, it's actually not just, uh, uh, not just Kissinger, and uh, it's also Tom Friedman uh, who's going to be there and with Schwartzman, so it's really bad. Um, so as we've heard, um, the MIT Lester report is a kind of case of failed disclosure. Key information is missing. There have been more uh, successful cases of disclosure in the past, however, and with enough pressure, universities can actually reveal some of their secrets. So one example is the um, Uncoke My Campus uh, campaign started by uh, students at George Mason University in Virginia. Uncoke My Campus aims to shed light on the partnerships between the uh, academic institutes and the Koch brothers, the billionaires who made their wealth from oil and uh, pollution industry. So the political agenda of the Koch brothers is uh, not a secret, of course. They promulgate so-called free market ideology. They've sponsored climate change denial campaigns, as well as campaigns to dismantle labor unions. Uh, the powerful machinery that they've built affects American politics through so many different channels that some people call it the Coctopus. Get it, like octopus? Um, so no, no investigative journalism is really needed to figure out the kinds of projects, academic projects, that they would back. Naturally, they would fund academics who produce reports and policy prescriptions that serve the Koch's interest, that call for privatization, tax cuts, more limited government oversight, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and indeed, uh, George Mason University, where UnCoke my campus started, has been an, in an intellectual center for this kind of uh, right-wing free market ideology. Uh, now, the students who started uh, UnCoke my uh, campus knew all of this, uh, but they wanted to understand the extent of the Koch's influence. What can money buy you at universities apart from prestige and legitimacy? 
They found that at uh, George Mason University, among other schools, the Koch Foundation had a say in faculty hiring. At Florida State University, for example, one economist, supported by the family, admitted the Kochs want faculty members who will promote their ideology and that, quote, if we are not willing to hire such faculty, they are not willing to fund us, end quote. The UnCoke project also found that donations are often split into annual installments, which the Koch Foundation can cut if it decides that the academic recipients aren't living up to the foundation's, quote, objectives and, quote, mission. So uh, the students found all of this by pressuring universities and the government to disclose the actual terms of the partnerships. Uh, and the terms, I, by the terms I mean here, the actual terms and conditions, not the vague percentages uh, of the kind we saw in the Lester report, as uh, Sally described. Uncoke My Campus examined other universities across the country, including MIT, that receive money from the Coke, apart from George Mason and Florida State. It was found that between 2015 and 2017, the Kochs and their foundations gave over $250 million to universities. The terms of many of these donations, I would say most of them, remain uh, unknown. So it's clear that universities, at a minimum, must disclose all these funding sources and their actual terms so that the community can evaluate uh, them. This is essential. And obviously, these problematic partnerships aren't limited to the Koch brothers, as we've heard. There are also the war criminals, like MBS and his government. And there's the Sackler family, who produce OxyContin, the addictive opioid, which has influenced medical curricula at Tufts to promote opioid prescriptions and thereby increase their bottom line. There's MIT's embrace of corporations embodied by corporate academic hybrids on campus, such as the Media Lab and the Broad Institute. MIT's partners include IBM and Google, fossil fuel giants like ExxonMobil and BP, big media companies like Comcast, big pharma like Novartis, weapons manufacturers like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Elbit, and chemical polluters like DuPont. Not to mention, we didn't even get there, alliances with the Pentagon. So we have the right to know the terms and the details of all of these partnerships because they shape the direction and also the silences and the omissions in academic work. But transparency won't set us free. The lack of information obviously isn't the major issue here. Really, it's about an unjust distribution of power across campus and the surrounding community. As the ousted professor, Stephen Salida, put it, quote, platitudes about faculty governance and student leadership notwithstanding, universities inhibit democracy in ways that would please any thin-skinned despot. So we'll need something more imaginative than transparency to address all of that. And that's what the next section, Repair, is about. Uh, but first, we have uh, Ruth Berry from MIT. Well, I was also asked to sort of jumpstart this repair section. And I want to tell you a little parable um, from the past. The Committee Against Apartheid, which was formed at, in MIT in the late 80s, with the primary goal of convincing the Institute to, to divest of its holdings in South Africa, uh, is part of this little parable. There, the members of the Committee uh, Against Apartheid met with Paul Gray, who was the president at the time, and members of the corporation in order to pressure them. Um, there were unsightly shanty towns that were built in front of the student center to call attention to the problem. And in 1989, the administration, in the person of Associate Provost Jay Kaiser, sent in the campus police to tear down the shanty town that had been built and to beat up and arrest the students who were resisting the tearing down of their shanty town. Students had asked a number of faculty members if we would be there to witness whatever was going to happen. They didn't know quite how violent it would be. And so I was actually there and witnessed all this. I was thrown to the ground as I tried to protect a student head from a campus police boot. Um, and as Louis Menand III, who was then in our political science department, said, 
Once again, paddy wagons have replaced communication. It was decided, however, in the controversy that followed all that, to reconstitute CJAC, which was the Corporation Joint Advisory Committee on Institute-Wide Affairs. CJAC, which seated six uh, corporation members, six students, and six faculty members to discuss things. And then in 1991, after a colloquium on apartheid and divestment and much discussion, CJAC voted to divest um, and brought that decision to the corporation. Now the corporation didn't entirely divest from holdings in South Africa, but it went quite far and that CJAC committee was a good, was a good thing. So that's one, one small hopeful story from the past about repair. That is joint committees that include uh, faculty and students in power decisions. Okay, now songs are a good way to repair the people who push for repair. There have always been songs as part of the social protest movements in America because many things are represented better in song than in prose or speech because song helps to firm up community and because songs give us courage. And that was certainly true in the civil rights movement. The old union song, Which Side Are You On?, was written by Florence Reese in 1931. Her husband, Sam, was a miner and an organizer of the 1931 Harlan strike. They got word that the company wanted to get rid of Sam and was sending its thugs over to kill him. And so he got out of the house just in time, out of the back door, just before they arrived. Mrs. Reese was there with their two little girls and she, she said that they stuck their guns into the closets, in, under the beds, into the piles of dirty laundry, and the girls were crying and so on. After they left, Florence Reese was so outraged that she tore, she, not having paper, <laughs> tore a calendar off the wall and on the back of it, she wrote the original words, to which side are you on, which she put to a Baptist hymn tune which had actually once been a ballad tune. But a good, a good tune begs to be used again, and so I put new words to this fine old union song. I don't know, are we going to put them up? The words? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to sing this song, and I'm going to ask you to sing the chorus with me. Which side are you on? The words are easy. <laughs> Hello and welcome everyone, come. Hello and welcome everyone, come listen to my song. The verses, they are very short, it won't take very long. Which side are you on? 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 A crown, a crown prince come. I've got, sorry, I'm going to start again. <laughs> Which side are you on? Which side are you on? A crown prince comes to visit to take us by the hand. No partnering with killers in Middle Eastern lands. Which side are you on? 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 Our sacred halls of learning, our research and our skills are subsidized by corporate greed. They pay the research bills. Which side are you on? 
Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Our hopes and dreams are up for sale. Profit takes their place. MIT and Harvard sold in the marketplace. Which side are you on? 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 Our names and reputations are compromised and trashed. They get our inventiveness and our schools get Judas cash. Which side are you on? 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 Provosts and administrators, presidents and deans, Listen to your faculty, I'll tell you what that means. Which side are you on? 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 We have to know what's going on. We have to have our say. But where about where the fruits of our labor go and how we earn our pay? Which side are you on? 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 The issues here are very clear. The battle lines are drawn. It's time to raise our voices and say which side we're on. Which side are you on? 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 Well, that was great. Um, we're starting the repair section now. Uh, that was kind of a great introduction to it, getting us uh, really thinking about this. My name's Ryan. I'm a member of the Coalition to Stop the Genocide in Yemen. And before I dive into my specific proposal for repair, I just want to talk about the repair section in general. I think it's very important for us to consider, when thinking about how to repair these issues, to break from the confines of what is considered possible within the capitalism, within the neoliberal ideology of the universities, and within the US empire. Because what's realistic and what's possible in these institutions is generally for students to go on from these elite universities to make bombs and weapon systems that kill poor people around the world, to be middle managers or executives at corporations profiting off the destruction of the environment, off the blood, sweat, and tears of the laboring people of, of this world, or off the death and destruction like we see in the opioid crisis, or so many other terrible things. So if we remain within these confines of possibility and say we need to do what's realistic within this twisted system, which has the vast majority of the people in this, on this planet eking by day to day, then I hate to say it, we're fucked if we can't get beyond that. What's possible under the system is the war in Yemen, the genocide there. What's possible under the system is the enrichment of a tiny fraction of people, like the three wealthiest people in this country, who own as much as the bottom half of this country. That's what's realistic. And it's not for the people. So my proposal, it isn't realistic under the current system. It's something that would require real change to the fundamental power relations in our society. And it's that Harvard and MIT and the other institutions which have profited uh, from their ties with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, from the ties they've they have with the weapons manufacturers or the merchants of death, as one of our friends likes to call them, um, these universities should pay reparations to the people of Yemen 
and to the people of the world. You know, Harvard, thank you. As others have already mentioned, uh, Harvard's president made the absurd and actually quite insulting assertion that the $40 billion endowment that Harvard has is apolitical. This is a joke. This is incredibly political. What happens with this $40 billion is quite, quite political. Right now, it goes to the enrichment of the few, to the advancement of Harvard and its alumni, and uh, uh, not all of its alumni, but the vast majority, <laughs> and, and a very few wealthy people in this country and around the world. And so Harvard and MIT, my proposal is very simple, and others, they should pay reparations to the people of Yemen. I don't want some big you know, press release type, Harvard's so great, look how they're helping poor people. No, give the people of Yemen the money to repair their country, to fix the problems there, of course, stop funding the Saudis, stop making ties with them in the UAE and these other countries, and uh, let the people of Yemen figure it out. And then also provide scholarships for the people from Yemen to come to universities here or around the world. My guess is they probably aren't going to want to go to Harvard and MIT, even though they're elite universities. So you know, let them go somewhere else and get Harvard and MIT's you know, influence out of Yemen. Uh, this is just one small problem that uh, Harvard and MIT have created or helped to create. Uh, there's lots of other ones, and I think we'll hear. Uh, and Harvard and MIT aren't the only university involved in this. But I think this is more of the type of the lines we need to be thinking along if we're really going to repair the harm caused by universities. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Amir Moharib. I'm a fellow at Harvard Medical School in Infectious Diseases. I want to focus on Yemen, uh, thinking about the repair um, portion of our session. It is regrettable that there are no shortage of harms that should be repaired in Yemen, and I want to speak a little bit about what those harms look like and then uh, consider what a repair would be. And so a lot of it was touched on already, but the Saudi blockade in Yemen is a very unique type of blockade. It has stopped a country which imports most of its food from getting adequate food in to a population <laughs> that much of whom is internally displaced. We heard about the cholera epidemic in Yemen. I would say the epidemic of malnutrition and diarrheal disease in Yemen have been synergistic. For the medical reports that are coming out of Yemen, we have children who are obviously the most vulnerable in a circumstance like this being the most affected. An outbreak of cholera where the numbers we have now are probably not accurate because the cholera testing equipment is not widely available, but based on the rough case definitions we have, it's still on the order of eight to 10,000 cholera cases a week with what investigations they have, uh, they have that are reporting out of Yemen. There's a good chance that's not accurate because the means we have for testing cholera at Yemen are quite primitive. The means we have for testing for non-cholera diarrheal diseases are quite primitive as well. And the medical reports that are coming out of Yemen quite clearly point this, or at least correlate, the outbreaks of diarrheal disease with areas that have been bombed by Saudi and Emirati uh, kind of coalition forces. Those areas have had high altitude bombing that have clearly affected water treatment facilities, sewage plants, and medical personnel as well, so that humanitarian agencies like Doctors Without Borders, as well as physicians and medics working within Yemen, have been targets, or at least been victims, of these types of attacks. I will, not to belabor the point, but there are many other diseases that have been reported in Yemen that are ancient scourges as far as what we have here in North America or in Europe. So vaccine-preventable diseases like measles and mumps, diseases like diphtheria, and there's real concern for a polio epidemic at Yemen, but there's no way to test for it because there are, they complain of having a lack of reagents to run the tests. So we need not have much of an imagination to understand what repair should look like in a circumstance like Yemen. The physicians that we have connections with report that there are oxygen shortages in the operating room, that there are anesthesia shortages. And this is to say nothing of the mental health effects that will probably live on for many years for children who are internally displaced or living in Yemen. And so there 
are many resources that we have in the medical school or in the institutions themselves here in Boston that could be leveraged in such a way. But I would make a couple of comments on how they could possibly be leveraged. First, I would say there are already multilateral agencies and relief, humanitarian relief agencies that are working in Yemen that have expertise on the ground and are quite transparent about what is needed. So the UN comes out regularly with figures of what uh, is required, either for, uh, for immediate relief or for long-term repair. And I'm thinking specifically about the healthcare facilities there in Yemen. So that is an area where our institutions have much to contribute. The second thing I would say is it should not be done, any kind of repair ought not to be done as a form of charity, but more of as an obligation, an obligation that we are somewhat of a party to the harms that have been committed. The third thing I would say is that there is expertise within Yemen between the physicians and public health uh, agencies operating within Yemen to administer, or at least take a leading role in administering international aid that is brought there. And so while a political solution may be elusive, it is quite clear that in at least a circumstance like Yemen, if not for any of the other types of university partnerships that we've heard about today, including the partnerships with the Sackler family and so on, that we have expertise and resources here that can be leveraged in a way that wouldn't be groundbreaking, wouldn't be controversial, but would simply be meeting the demands that have been requested by those humanitarian agencies on the ground. The last thing I will say is the conflict of Yemen has been characterized by an attack on medical personnel and relief workers. So I would also say that there has been a harm done to those humanitarian agents and workers who work under the assumption that the Geneva Conventions will be followed. And so if we are a party to this conflict in any possible way, I believe reparations should include the, the harm that was done to them as well. And so that's where I'll end. Thank you. My name's Fiona, I'm an undergrad at MIT and I'm also the opinion editor of the student newspaper there called The Tech, um, which has uh, published some editorials over the past about year and a half criticizing MIT for the decisions it's made. Um, just as a quick disclosure, I'm here speaking for myself and not for the newspaper, so these represent my own opinions and not theirs. But yeah, anyways. Um, so. Um, some other people have mentioned already that like, in response to all of the controversy surrounding MBS coming to campus, um, MIT released a report, or rather Richard Lester released a report regarding its relations, and one thing that also emerged out of this whole debacle was um, the creation of this committee to review MIT's international engagements. But uh, like other people have said, it's the steps that MIT has taken thus far are like pretty unsubstantive and sort of just to give you a sense of like exactly how vacuous everything is, I'll read like a quote from um, President Reif's email to the community describing what this committee is going to do. He said, quote, the committee will report to the MIT administration by this coming September. They will offer guidelines for action as well as expertise to call on when MIT assesses new international engagements. So basically he describes nothing. And <laughs> there is around like a paragraph and a half other than this in the email describing what the committee will do. But again, it's pretty unsubstantive. There, um, and also the committee is like entirely composed of faculty members with no explanation for how these faculty members were chosen for the committee. There are no formal mechanisms in place for the community members of MIT or the general public to learn about what the committee is doing, how it made any sort of decisions, or even to ultimately hear about the decisions that it's made or to voice any sort of opinion. So there's like very little hope, I guess, like that this committee, even though they're trying to pretend to be very progressive, will create any sort of substantive change. So in order for like a committee like this to make any sort of meaningful change rather than just be simply used to placate people who are angry, um, I think there are several changes that should be made. One, the committee 
the committee should not only be composed of faculty members, but it should also be composed of students. Two, its actions should be entirely transparent, such that there's like potential for the public to hold it accountable. And three, there should exist some sort of enforcement mechanism to ensure that its work ultimately holds weight in MIT's decisions. So the best way to achieve these goals is up to debate, but some examples of steps that MIT could take include granting the committee ultimate decision-making power over the institute's financial ties rather than simply using it as a mechanism to give the President Reif and other administrators um, recommendations, which they probably won't follow. Um, <laughs> Uh, allowing anybody in the MIT community to apply for membership in the committee and determining membership through some sort of democratic means, such as an election, rather than just allowing administrators to pick who is on the committee, and also implementing some sort of public forum or online comment forum or anything like that to allow people who aren't ultimately on the committee to voice their opinions. Some sort of mechanisms like these are really necessary to ensure accountability and ultimately that the committee can actually do any, do something as opposed to just exist. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Lauren and um, I am going to be speaking about how protests and um, people uprising uh, has been a, a sense of repair, I guess you could say. Okay, so um, I am a part of the Coalition to Stop the Genocide in Yemen. And um, basically, protests and people's movement, ha movement have always been the main drivers behind progressive change in the world. In this spirit and with this perspective, we have been organizing anti-war protests at universities around the Boston area to oppose these institutions' ties with companies and countries involved in the war in Yemen, which is we have protested at MIT, at Northeastern, um, at uh, BU, <laughs> and um, Tufts as well. These protests have begun to awaken a dormant energy and growing numbers of students want to be involved and hear about injustices that have been carried out by US imperialism by the way of war profiteers like Raytheon, and not just Raytheon, but places like Draper Labs, um, Lockheed Martin, and the such. So far, we have organized protests at BU, Northeastern, MIT, and Tufts, which I said previously. These protests have put pressure on these schools and also helped to form anti-war student organizations on campus. And when I say that there has been a dormant energy that has been awakened, literally, it seems like as soon as we step out, students are like, what? <laughs> There's people that actually care about these issues and want to actually raise them to the light and actually talk about this. It, it's, it's pretty inspiring and very um, encouraging to see students actually come together and fight and not just feel like they're there to uh, do their midterms or their finals, but you're actually there to act, you're supposed to use your, the, the learning that you're getting from these institutions to help other people that are not getting the same education as you. And so I'm glad to see that students are actually taking an active role in this. This has given us tremendous hope and has shown that students aren't just preoccupied with making peace with the many injustices carried out by these war profiteers in exchange for a lucrative career. While it is disheartening to see some young suited college students nervously pass their resume to recruiters, and when I say nervous, they were nervous. <laughs> they would like they would come in with like these really ill-fitting suits and like their backpacks, hoping that they could get like a hoping that they could get like an internship, much less from these places. And it's just like they're begging at these at the feet of these people that are are that are crafting bombs that are bombing these inst these countries. And it's it's sad to see the optics of it and how it, it and yeah. <laughs> but it is encouraging to know there are students who will stand outside and see right through these warmongers' plans and agendas and fight for a better and sustainable future that upends the status quo and brings revolutionary change. 
These protests are a first step to forcing universities to, uh, to change how they conduct themselves and who they partner with. They're an important start and are part of a larger movement against the role that colleges and universities play in US imperialism. Through the power of the people, we can change these universities and eventually the world. And that's what I hope will happen with these protests. Hopefully there will be energy where people can stop and actually realize what, what am I learning from this material? Is, why are we learning basic things? Like I learned from uh, a colleague of mine that um, came from the Harvard Kennedy School. They're speaking on really basic questions like what is imperialism or what is uh, colonialism? These are people that pay literally like sixty thousand, eighty thousand dollars a year, and you're speaking on basic questions like that. <laughs> Sounds very remedial, but <laughs> I will say, <laughs> hopefully, we can have students that are actually actively questioning the things that they learn and try to advance. You're there for a reason. Now take that education and try to force change within the world. Thank you. Give everyone like a second to shuffle out and resettle. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Salome Fulyun, um, and I was asked to share with you all a few words about my time with a movement called Royal Must Fall. Uh, we were a movement at HLS, Harvard Law School, um, during the 2015 2016 academic year that arose out of some student activism the prior year. Um, sort of protesting police violence. It was a crazy time because you're in evidence and it's like all of these grand juries are just not indicting murderers and no, your professors won't even talk about it. <laughs> so it sort of came out of those protests. Um, Royal Must Fall was started to address the history of slavery at Harvard Law School and the continual structural complicity of HLS in racial violence and upholding white supremacy. So specifically, I'd like to reflect on both the power of visualization and connecting structural asks with like a neat visual meme or rallying cry, as well as sort of the perils or shortbacks of doing so. So the symbolic rallying cry of Royal Must Fall was for the law school to remove the seal of the royal family as our school seal. The royals granted the land to form the law school, but the wealth that enabled them to do so was the result of Caribbean plantations and slave labor. The continued use of this seal by the law school was a perfect symbol of the role of the law in general and HLS specifically in upholding and furthering white supremacy and racial violence. So the school rather quickly agreed to change the seal, but they didn't really meet any of our more structural demands, like renaming the royal chair, endowing a critical race scholar, improving aid to first generation law students, particularly students of color, and creating a student seat on faculty committees to create more democratic accountability for a lot of sort of the backroom power brokering that happens at the law school. Um, they also didn't really address any of the asks that we had made in solidarity with workers at the law school. So the seal allowed us to create this really compelling narrative, but it, and it provided a really powerful symbol for our movement. But at the same time, it did open us up to this peril of the school claiming success based on this superficial change. Um, so when negotiations with the school on the structural demands stalled, some students chose instead to start occupying part of our student center, and they named it Belinda Hall, after a former slave of the royal family. Belinda successfully won a petition to the Massachusetts General Court requesting a pension from the proceeds of her enslaver's estate. This pension, which she was successful in getting, um, is considered one of the first cases of reparation for slavery. Oh, sorry. Um, and it inspired Belinda Hall to seek empowerment through community, so rather than seeking permission from a school that was sort of determinedly ignoring them. Like Belinda, these students similarly sought justice through reclamation. And while this approach was organic, immediate, and empowering, I think one of the drawbacks for me from about Belinda Hall was that it was also temporal and contingent. So 
there's not a Belinda Hall at, at, law, at HLS anymore. Um, <laughs> that's great. That's awesome to hear. Um, so that's a perfect segue into what I'm going to say next, which is, nevertheless, I believe Belinda Hall continues to serve as a powerful second act to Royal Must Fall, and a reminder that while much of the elite education, at least I received as a law student, seemed to impress upon us that we have no power to change the system, which I think is just meant to make us feel comfortable taking jobs as handmaids, maidens to capital, um, we actually, in mo these moments of resistance, have incredible power. And I would encourage all the members of the Harvard and MIT and larger community here to remember that. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Dayton Andrews. I'd first like to thank the community of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the students of MIT. Um, my name is Dayton, uh, like I said before, I'm with the United Front Against Displacement, based in the Bay Area of California, and this place is too cold for me. <laughs> I can't handle it. I spent 10 minutes playing with ice this morning, because I just never seen it on the ground before. It was amazing. Um, but. What I'd like to talk about is really, you know, as we talk about really these external relationships, how these universities' relationships are affecting uh, really the relationships with these imperialist interests outside the country, it's all really reflective of how uh, they're treating people at home. And so I'm a part of the United Front Against Displacement, and we're working with both homeless and uh, tenants uh, to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to resist evictions and displacement in the Bay Area and uh, working to really uh, fight back when people are being pushed out of informal and formal residences. Um, and also looking to expose the harassment by cops and developers. We're building coalitions to take protests to the steps of these corporations and to the steps of City Hall across uh, cities in the Bay Area. Uh, we've been trying to reach out to students at universities such as UC Berkeley, San Francisco State, and local community colleges, and we've been making a lot of progress. There are also serious, some barriers to uh, convincing students to see past their career's prospects and actually unite with working people against corporations and their own universities. Uh, despite a lot of fanfare and progressive posturing, uh, universities and corporations closely cooperate in order to develop and buy up property in working class neighborhoods, displacing entire communities. Uh, when people can't afford to relocate, they often on the streets or living in their vehicles. Uh, we've been working to expose these attacks on working people in areas such as West Oakland and People's Park, owned by the University of California. Uh, and we're also working to make short-term demands to really address the immediate situations of people on the edge um, without having to wait for politicians to take the initiative. Um, we're trying to build a movement that's looking to actually address the root causes of gentrification and homelessness. Frankly, the fact that capitalism allows these institutions to exploit the working people for profit, it really goes right back to that. I mean, we live in the Bay Area, which is the center of a lot of technology, and we're constantly told that there's gonna be a quick fix to what's going on, that eventually one of y'all is gonna develop an app for that. Um, <laughs> but y'all develop apps every week, and they mostly tank. <laughs> and then you end up on the streets, or you know, working for Uber or Lyft. So, in reality, we actually have to see past this, past the fact that our careers are not ultimately going to solve any of these issues. We have to look past these interests and actually unite with our neighbors. We have to unite with working people and actually actively fight back. So thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, my name is Caesar McDowell. I'm a professor at MIT. Uh, so uh, I'm torn a little bit. I'm going to read off of this because I had to write this. I'm torn because you know I've been asked to talk about how we rebuild, and I can do that. Uh, but I also want to talk about my outrage at the complicity of the Modern Research Academy in legitimizing, dehumanizing behavior abroad, behavior that we would not tolerate at home. Unless, of course, it is against people who are black, brown, poor, 
First Nation, female, queer, or trans. I need to learn how to speak to both of these things at the same time. I think we need to learn how to do that. We need to speak out and protest against dehumanization in any form, and we need to learn how to engage in dialogue and action that will allow us to build a just and equitable society. Last year, in a, this uh, joint appeal to youth and civil society, international educator uh, Daisaku Ikeda, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, um, Adolfo Perez Esquivel, offered universities three requirements for educating students for global citizenship. A common awareness of universal sense of history in order to prevent repetition of, of human tragedies. An understanding that Earth is our common home and there is no one and where no one is to be excluded on the basis of difference. And three, a humane orientation of politics, economics, cultivating the wisdom needed to achieve a sustainable future. I think their recommendations could also be guidelines for what universities need to understand as they make decisions not only about teaching, but also, and probably most importantly, around the issues of this evening, around research, funding, and how and policy work. Uh, so in short, I actually think transparency is needed so that we can uh, assess decisions to finance and research education in the academy. And I think, actually, we're to apply this to, M to MIT, there's one simple question we can ask and that universities can ask and be held accountable for about money coming into it. And the question is this. Is this contribution available because it capitalized on human suffering? If the answer is yes, then the money shouldn't be taken. If taken, it should be protested. And if protested, we still need to create the space to engage in dialogue that would open people's minds and heart to the suffering of others. This, I think, is our path forward, living in and respecting the duality of our needs for protesting and rebuilding and the courage to live fully in both. Hello, I'm uh, Alonzo. I'm a student at MIT. Uh, I helped out a little bit to put this event together. Uh, and so I, I want to um, tie together a little bit uh, the ice idea of, of reckoning and of repair. Uh, and I want to do so in, in the context of some uh, recent developments at MIT. So, you know, in October of, of, of last year, MIT announced uh, a fairly major restructuring. It's going to introduce a, a new college, uh, the Stephen A. Schwartzman College of Computing. Uh, this new college is supposed to be, you know, the, the North Star of, or something like that, of, of, of ethical <laughs> computing research. Uh, the, the, uh, the true North in, in, in the quest to, uh, um, you know, bring uh, computing for the people, as, uh, as, as uh, Friedman will We'll talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so, you know, when I, when I heard about this, I, I was in the middle of the semester. Uh, I was inundated with work. Um, and, I, and I was a little bit, you know, just kind of discouraged uh, you know, with all this stuff with uh, the crown prince. Uh, and nothing seemed to be happening. And I was just kind of like, oh, you know, uh, what am I supposed to do? You know, I'm too busy to pay attention to this. I'm sure there are plenty of sketchy, sketchy corporate shenanigans going on, but like, you know, uh, what am I going to do about it? You know? um, and then several other students you know, had a similarly defeatist attitude. So why do I bring this up? You know, as Professor Ruth Perry mentioned, uh, for any kind of repair to happen, we have to you know, repair ourselves. And we have to re repair this, this, this attitude. Uh, uh, that, that um, you know, when you say, what, what am I going to do about it? There, uh, one, you, you kind of assume that, that, that everything is uh, unchangeable. And you also forget that, that it's not really about what am I going to do about it. It's what about, you know, what are we going to do about it? Uh, uh, these things change uh, uh, with like, a collective effort. Um, so any, anyway, so, you know, um, uh, fast forward a few months. 
and uh, I see a, an interesting Facebook post by another student. It turns out uh, another war criminal is coming to campus, Henry Kissinger. Uh, he is coming, in fact, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, MIT will be celebrating this, this new college. Um, and he's going to come to speak on the end of the Enlightenment. And, <laughs> and, and specifically on the need for AI research to have a moral compass. Uh, yeah, uh, Henry Kissinger is going to come to talk about morality. I and mean, you can't get much more cynical than that. Um, so you know, by this point, uh, well, for one, you know, Henry Kissinger uh, is grotesque. Uh, I'm I'm uh, from Mexico, and Latin America has been, you know, decimated by uh, his policies and by the empire that he represents. Uh, so it gets personal. On top of that, people at MIT uh, had begun to actually do something about Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, there was a panel discussion that I went to, and and you know. Uh, talking to people, I get energized, and, and other people get energized, and, and we start to break this, this spell of apathy uh, that, that is all too common amongst uh, the, the student body. Uh, and so, yeah, so, so the, this Facebook post, uh, it's a student, he you know, calls on, on, on fellow students to, you know, to do something about it, uh, and, and people respond. Uh, you know, we, we get together, uh, we, we talk about, you know, what, you know, what to do, uh, uh, we, we, we start actually peering into what, what this college represents a little more because, I mean, most of us were pretty ignorant. I didn't know who Schwarzman was. Um, um, I didn't know, you know, just how tied this new college is going to be with, with the uh, uh, interests of, of American empire as it tries to bring AI to all sectors of the military, as the Pentagon said, uh, and to do so with the help of big tech and, and uh, our universities. And, and so we plan a sequence of events. We, we, you know, we put on uh, a counter event um, as, a, as a sort of a response to the celebrations that are occurring this week. The, these celebrations last three days. They started yesterday and the end tomorrow. And so yesterday we put on uh, an event to uh, 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 shed light on who Kissinger and Schwarzman are, uh, to uh, well, reckon with MIT's role in imperialism and the role that computing research plays in, in all sorts of injustices. Uh, and the event was fairly successful. People you know, packed the room, and once it was over, they stuck around uh, to talk to one another, uh, uh, to continue this process of, of, of reckoning and of uh, thinking about how to repair. Um, so tomorrow, as the mass murderer gets treated as a luminary by MIT, uh, residents from all across the Boston area, residents who are all too often ignored and trampled on by MIT and these universities, as well as students, faculty, and staff, will, co will continue building on yesterday's event and on the career fair protests that were mentioned earlier by holding a protest of our own uh, near the auditorium where the genocidal maniac will enlighten a crowd of corporate donors and, and imperialist stooges. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, what are all these activities for? What, what, do, they, what do they accomplish? Um, certainly, they alone will not lead to uh, you know, dismantling MIT's relationships with plutocrats, uh, war criminals, and the US war machine more broadly. They alone will not repair our broken system. But what they do begin to dismantle is this nihilistic attitude that says, you know, what am I going to do about it? Uh, an attitude that makes it impossible to build the kinds of movements that we need in order to uh, change uh, not just our universities, but, but the, the world more broadly. Uh, and just as importantly, these actions inspire us to imagine a different kind of university, one that is uh, intimately connected to and that works for the communities, local, national, and international, in which, it, in which they are embedded, as opposed to working for imperialist powers, uh, corporate donors, and uh, billionaire slumlords like Stephen Schwartzman. Uh, they inspire us to imagine a world, for instance, in which the $1 billion being poured into the College of Computing and the new building in which it will be housed instead get poured into making affordable housing for the thousands of people who suffer under the likes of Schwartzman and his company.
So I hope you will join us tomorrow as we engage in this process of reckoning and repair. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. So at this point, um, you all should have a blue index card in your program. And if you don't, there's a stack of them back there. There's also a bunch of pens over there. Um, I want to take two minutes and just think about what repair looks like on your campus and in your community. You're going to have exactly the length of a very short song by a band from Boston called The Modern Lovers. And I chose this song called Government Center because it's about breaking into Government Center at night and having a party. And <laughs> why not? So just write down what repair looks like on your campus, in your community. Um, we're then going to have, we probably have time for about five or six people just to read your card up here. So if you're really, if you're just writing something and it's just so awesome and you just want to share it, start lining up here. When the song's over, we'll have five or six people read those cards. Then we're going to break. We're going to go out. There's a board out there and we're going to ask each of you to put your card on the board where some wonderful tape supply personnel will be there to help you fix it with adhesive. Um, you're probably already done now, but I'm still going to play this song. So get writing. Hi there, everybody. Um, my name is Mike. Some of you probably recognize me from the work I did with uh, Peace Action and so forth in the past, and also from my involvement with the um, uh, divestment protests. And I just wanted to say that um, only, so much, uh, can, only so much change can happen in elite universities. And the trajectory of your education can't be, how do I get a lucrative job to pay off my enormous student loans? Uh, college, education, health care, and housing must be rights. You know? And uh, we all need to be prepared to put our money where our mouth is and uh, pay more taxes to make sure that's possible. My name is Tom Johnson, and I work at three corporatized universities. And to me, repair looks like the five unions that I belong to. I'll just read, read what I wrote here quickly. Universities are just one among many institutions that are failing us. Congress, corporations, police, hospitals, Supreme Court, the Catholic Church, sports teams, and on and on and on. What is the significance of these overarching failures, and what is the way forward? Thank you. Hi, I'm Karina. I'm an undergraduate at MIT. Um, I'm the president of one of the career organizations there. Um, and I think one of the paths to um, repair at MIT is something that is very important to me is like the dissemination of information and how powerful information education really is. I mean, I think that's why all of us want to protect our academic institutions. So I think one of the things, best ways to help um, remedy uh, MIT is to educate everyone at MIT on these issues and to encourage communication and collaboration between the separate advocacy groups because I feel like a lot of times the advocacy groups are kind of far away from each other and they feel isolated within the MIT institution and I think if we all try to come together and like we will feel um, our collective voice to be power more powerful um, and making sure everyone at MIT is kind of in on the revolution you know, making sure they have the information and, and uh, necessary to empower themselves. Hi, my name is Jeevan. Um, we know that Cambridge or Harvard and MIT don't have to pay pro taxes because they're technically nonprofits, despite the fact they have billions of dollars in their endowments. So one thing repair could look like is increased pilots, which are payments in lieu of taxes, from Harvard and MIT to fund tuition-free higher education for Cambridge public school graduates. Um, hi, I'm Abby, and um, for repair, I'm going to do my best to advocate for the ongoing and permanent interruption and cessation of all business as normal at my uh, local alma maters, which include Harvard and MIT, and won't accept anything less. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Jonathan King from the MIT, from the faculty newsletter, the only committee at all of MIT elected only by the faculty and not by the administration. <laughs> right, Ruth here is a, a number of people here have spoken represent that, and also Mass Peace Action. We're going to try to repair the Massachusetts state government. Uh, Paul didn't have enough time to mention, uh, so a group of people have introduced a number of bills in the state legislature. They're in the state legislature, and one of them calls on the state of Massachusetts to divest its pension funds from any corporation that provides weapons for, for Saudi Arabia. Uh, and it's going to come forward, and there's going to be hearing, and every single resident of Massachusetts has a state rep, has a state senator, and you can call them and ask them to support the bill. And you can come and testify when the hearing comes up, because we'll let you know. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Watkins. I'm a longtime Cambridge resident. And to me, repair in, in our community of Cambridge would look like MIT and Harvard sharing their bus systems and their broadband internet with the residents of Cambridge, as well as housing their graduate students. Thank you. My name is Chi Seng Poon. I'm a research scientist at MIT, or I used to be, because I've just been recently wrongfully discharged by MIT without following due process. And so I know the system very well. And um, I think the first step for today's topic, when we talk about disclosure and repair, I think the first thing that we're going to need to do is to organize and participate and get into the system, get involved in the governance. Especially faculty, most of the faculty are silent on campus. You don't, if you're silent, you don't have voice, you don't have force. But more importantly are the students. The students are the future of you know, um, new generation. Students need to get involved and speak out. I am staging a one-man campaign against the university. I'm challenging the system. I'm challenging the administration. I'm challenging the MIT Corporation. And I'm making them speak out and respond to me every step of the way. Last few days, I just sent out mass communication to all the faculty. I'm putting the MIT Corporation on the spot. And I'm demanding them to respond to me. If I can do it, a one-man band, I'm sure all of us here can do it if we work together. Okay, last minute decision to come up here. My name is Hatch Starrett. It's very simple. Uh, for the community, uh, we need to do some online research to find out where all the contributions from real estate interests are coming from that feed city councilors, incumbent and candidates alike. And you go to the public finance website of the city of the state of Massachusetts and you can find this out. But I think we could use a little cluster of three or four people working on the computer. It's a little tedious. And some people who know, been around a little longer like me can tell you a little bit more about how to tell whether it is a real estate type of contribution or not. But every time I try to raise this at city council, the mayor says, oh, no, you can't talk about that. That's personal. That's what? And when Zondervan, who was here a moment on screen, tried to speak about that, the councilors, the ones who get developer money, walked out. So uh, see me if you'd like to help. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Nina Litton, and I'll speak tonight as an alum of MIT, one of the muggles from the Sloan School. And as empathetic as I am to the need to, you know, for money to pay the lights, I think there's fear in the hearts of the administration when, when we have a, a federal government full of science deniers. But that doesn't mean that we should sell out our humanity. I think it's time to double down on the common humanity and our neighborhood, our neighbors, ourselves, and win over our opponents 
to a more humane and loving approach to flourishing. And may we all work together and let it be so.